now our 60 days begin ticking from yesterday and that is why we reaffirm our commitment to complete this process within the set timelines. You never know. You could end up with a reconstitution of the panel itself. You never know. Everything is on the table. We have also resolved that we shall be extending invitations to stakeholders and members of the public to present their memorandums to the committee. We continue to tell Kenyans to ignore the naysayers. There will always be those who do not, who feel threatened for whatever reason by something so illustrious because this is wonderful work and we, we, we're going to move very, very fast. On the question of whether we are able to stop the selection panel, we are not writing to them to uh, stop doing their work. It's just to take the, what has been described by the Honorable Eugene Omaro in our meeting as judicial notice. We have adjourned to Friday this week at 10 a.m. to allow the Secretariat and the technical teams to work on prioritization of the issues and guide us on how we prioritize what issues do we begin with. We were by duty. Chief 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 she told us she will take us to Australia to study in part. Madam Judith said, first come, first served. At Wakati Alukwa Nasema at Ngombe, you cannot sell at that price. I remember the car which was sold, it was about 60 to 70. But because of that, Araka, they, they had to sell in a very low so that to cater faster. I sold the motorbike. Here is an agreement. Here is an agreement. It is not a paperwork. It is an agreement that I sold my valuable motorbike. And it will pay up to 250,000. I have an agreement in the house. I have a dam. I have a dam. I have a scan. I have a dam. I have a dam. I have a dam. I have a dam. Let this organization be used as the last example to others, uh, Chair, and ensure that they are arrested and prosecuted, and ensure the money is being refunded to these Kenyans. Uyu amekuja hapa, badala kuja kuja kujibu mashitaka mbayo kamati na mulisa, anansa kusema kamati ndi umekosea. Kamati na kosea aje, na wanaulisa pesa wa Kenya. ESCC is firmly focused on a high level of corruption. We are looking into uh, cases involving uh, high-profile personalities guided by public interest, amount of money involved. What he has me, at the end of the statement, at the end of the day, 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 at the end is not a political party. We are a law enforcement body that uh, undertakes investigations professionally, objectively, and in accordance with the law. Wameniandika wamejaza maneno kwa magazeti sijui law society wamesema nini, sijui watu azimio wamesema nini, wacha nirudie ndio wasikie vizuri. Wale wanaiba pesa ya wananchi, wameangusha kampuni ya Mumias, wameenda wakaangusha kampuni ya eh, Nzoia, wahame Kenya. Wahame ama wasihame? Na wasipohama tunawafunga jela. Na wakiendelea wapange mpango waende mbinguni. Kazi yangu ya tatu nilikubaliana na nyinyi ni kunyorosha management. Kunyorosha management ya hizi kampuni. Kwa sababu inawezekanaje ati watu wanalete miwa. Si ndio? Wakulima wanalete miwa. Alafu mimi naulizwa ati nilipe wafanyikazi. Ati nilipe wa, wa, wakulima. Miwa ya wakulima ilienda wapi? Kabla sija, sija ambiwa nilipe, wilienda na nani? No principal, no board of, man, uh, no board of school management is supposed to inflate or increase even a single cent out of the amount that has been set because we do realize that the parents are also undergoing a lot of economic hardships and therefore the figure which is set by government is the figure that must be paid and no extra revenue uh, is supposed to be paid by anybody and any principal or any such teacher found uh, paying, uh, demanding extra amounts from the parents, the necessary disciplinary action will be taken. 
Well, that is a soapbox and of course uh, just getting a melange of issues as far as uh, the week has been regarding uh, the current state of play of our politics, our economy as well, our academia, where also we have the CS seeking to have 61 billion shillings waived off. Uh, that is uh, <clears throat> from uh, the varsities that are insolvent right now and he's proposing that the legislators should consider this. But let's just begin from uh, the talks briefly. Uh, and Eritu Maredi, and I know this is smack dab in the middle of uh, your interest as well. First of all, are you happy that a happy medium has been formed or has been realized right now? It seems the talks can commence smoothly. What are your trepidations? What are your fears? What are you sanguine and optimistic about it? Well, I have no fears. As I already commented earlier in the program, uh, any civilized modern democracy needs to be able to find ways to solve our problems and to hold one another to account. I, I think I made the comment that I believe myself when you see what is happening in West Africa, um, the political elites there who have been unable to respond to the needs of citizens are being booted out uh, primarily through the military yeah. but you saw last year uh, across the world um so uh, all i'm saying is that uh, uh, governments across the world need to understand certain things and and when you are unable or unwilling to respond to the needs of the citizen certain things will happen now to the talks themselves i think this is an opportunity and i hope our colleagues like uh, uh, of uh, Mr. Obath is here, our colleagues in the private sector um, take the opportunity, and, and all, not just private sector, all stakeholders, including the churches who are saying, uh, look, could the political class sit down and talk while well, the talks are here? So let us not be on the sidelines, and then things are not fixed to our satisfaction, then we come back later to complain. The way the issues have been bunched in, uh, in uh, let me say, five buckets, uh, five or six buckets, uh, these, these are fairly, uh, uh, it's, it's a very large number of issues. They require very serious professional approach to them. But at least it's, it has been yeah. paid down, uh, paid down to, from, to five, from ten. That um, yeah, yeah, there are five buckets of issues. But remember, like, for example, outstanding constitutional issues has four issues. Yeah, or oh, within that. that within yes, yes. So, you know, like, for example, Article 43 of the Constitution, which are economic rights, and they have decided to tack in cost of living as part of that. Um, of which you are really particularly intent that it should be part of this conversation. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm, not, I, I'm yeah. not saying that it is wrong to include them. I'm just explaining that the way the issues have been clustered is that uh, uh, one set of issues... Uh, labeled outstanding constitutional issues, they include cost of living in Article 43. The point being, the Constitution guarantees the citizen certain economic rights. Mm -hmm. What is happening is that this, the, the state has failed to provide for those economic rights, and, and hence, uh, uh, um, you know, a cost of living escalation that is uh, out of work. Then, uh, electoral justice is a second set of issues. Uh, the funds that uh, various uh, parliamentarians have wanted uh, and so on uh, including of course one of my favorites which is the fidelity of uh, of uh, political parties in the political party coalitions mm -hmm. and the law around political parties because political parties are at the heart of the constitutional arrangement if they don't exist then we don't have mm -hmm. a, a functioning political political culture all in all it's a great thing. It is 60 days, so it's not a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. For players, particularly our colleagues in the private sector, this is truly the time to step up uh, to the plate, to support the process, to even perhaps resource the process. But above all, that the solutions proposed, debated, adopted mm -hmm. should not be, you know, sort of uh, just light touch pedestrian solutions they ought to be really deeply thought out uh, uh, so that we use this moment to create uh, uh, useful reforms so i'm happy that we are where we are you're happy um my call is for the stakeholders 
uh, as I said, private sector, the churches or the religious bodies and others to step up. This is a time to step up and be counted. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the private sector, is it happy with the development? I mean, we are, we are very happy with this. We are very happy that, that at least um, the country is back to talking and there is a framework mm -hmm. which the talks are going to happen and the issues have been identified which is almost like, you know, saying we have all these issues, let, let us make them look less by compressing them into five, <laughs> into five, whatever it is. But it contains a sum total of what the two sides wanted mm. to be discussed. Mm -hmm. So we haven't, we, I think we, at least from that point of view, it's a very big step forward that nothing has been kicked out so that none of the parties feels as though they've come to the table and been disenfranchised in the process. Mm -hmm. Let the talks continue. 60 days is a tough time, it's a very short time. Public participation, question mark, what does it mean? Let us see how it, how it pans out. But the fear is the fear that you always have. You discuss all this, it's actually been made a parliamentary process because it has been discussed in both houses and given the nod. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a politician or a, or a constitutional expert, it means that the outcomes will eventually have to go back again into those places to then be signed off and put into law, mm -hmm. which I think is the intention. The, the ideal intention of the process is mm -hmm. that it shouldn't just be a talk show that happens and then things are not entrenched in some form of instrument that means it can then continue to be in the future. Mm -hmm. If you're discussing IBC, it has to go through a process because there's, there's an instrument that gave it life etc etc mm -hmm. the reality is that when it gets into the august house it can be completely changed and then it is passed in a different manner mm -hmm. and that really is a concern that we've had as a public as a private sector yeah. all through starting with the constitution itself mm -hmm. and the way the constitution having had public participation getting everybody there and a draft came out and then it went to Naivasha and came out completely you know substantially different from the way it went in Right? So, the fidelity of the process is a question. Mm -hmm. Once you've got public participation and everything else and you've got a document, it goes in and there's an opportunity to change it to something different. That, for me, is a concern as a, public, as a private sector that, yes, we can give our input, mm -hmm. but how much sanctity does that input have in the process? Mm -hmm. right? And that is something that I think a lot of people say, so why should I go and give my, my, my input? When at the end of the day, there is this body that can change anything they wish. Even if I have a very strong view, at the discussion point when the meeting is happening and, and, the, you know, and, the, and, and the pot is boiling and things are being cooked right outside, that is where it should be locked in. When it goes to parliament, it should be something that at least has had public participation mm -hmm. and the representatives of the people should respect what the people have said. And that for me is really the place I have a disconnect with all these things that happen and then they have to go through the august house so when we look at the figures that are there they are all political figures uh in terms of uh people who are discussing this and it's your feeling that maybe you should have a you know a, a neutral arbiter which is a public participation figure that will be holding uh, a sort of a thought on watching over whether the interest of the public as well they're being cemented so you're talking about the process propriety and the sanctity of it that it will not be short changed that we've seen before. When we have, uh, you know, Naivasha and uh, with the draft bills being amended and this, all these collections have been done. Yeah. When you talk about inclusivity, is, is that something we should consider as well? Because this is political players who are on yeah. the table. I, I think just to, just to complete that, yeah. the way the constitution has been drafted and all these processes have been put through is on the fact that we are all going to be honest brokers. That when it comes to that as a representative of the people, you go in and you talk on behalf of the people. But when you've got political parties, issues begin to change. Issues begin right? to change. Who is talking for the people? Who is talking? Good question. <laughs> Who is talking for the people when it, it comes to inclusivity? And I, I'm, and I think they've been raising a very German uh, concern on the voice of the people on this particular uh, panel. So the, the 10 member committee. Uh, how what's really constituted uh, coming up with this 10 member committee what really informed coming up with the 10 member committee i know maybe we're past that junction but it's not way too late 60 days uh you say it's short but, yeah, but uh, in terms of having faces of kenya as well is, is very key. but the bell um 
somebody must represent another. Uh, the, this tenure member committee, the, the significant sides of the political side, sat down and each side produced its five, for whatever considerations that there were. And in respect of how public participation would, would get into it, first you have to play the game for people to cheer up and see and comment and, and critique. I think it's good for these ten, they're going to be able to set the agenda, and then people weigh in with their views. But that's just views about the process. After a decision is made, you still need to step back and see how they weigh in on the decision that has been made. Mm -hmm. So public participation doesn't end simply because you are told about it at the beginning. Uh, at each stage, it has implications, and you want a view on that implication. So let, let's see how that uh, works out. Personally, I think that uh, uh, my colleagues have said this as well. We just agree with them that uh, the fact that we are talking is a very important thing. Uh, and about what you, it's a whole uh, universe of possibility of things you can discuss. The few that are here are just adequate for the moment. What I think should be important now is how does, how does society engage on a continue, continuing basis going forward? Uh, I just, I saw a clip there that you had earlier when uh, people are making comments in respect of, I think, the first choice uh, uh, company that uh, had defrauded or alleged to have defrauded people, you can see how artic articulately people are presenting their views and so on. Um, I think Kenyans have moved on, uh, particularly since 2010. And it's something that pro probably being contemporary, we don't see it. But I'm sure that history will, will judge Kenyans uh, favorably on this. That for better or for worse, things are coming out. People are talking about them and so on even if they disagree uh, uh, about them. I, um, a few years ago, I was uh, uh, on an overseas trip or s something that we were doing, mm -hmm. and there were delegations from an African country. It was Zimbabwe, let me just mention it. It's not entirely negative. So, Among them were people from the ruling party and people from the opposition. You know that even out there, they couldn't talk to each other. They could not be seen to have been talking to each other and so on. And we in Kenya had gone in with you know, people from all shades of political things, and they were surprised that was happening. So I think we have gone forward, and I really hope that uh, for this, there are some things in which there are substantive decisions. Others, let me tell you, uh, things around cost of living, for example, uh, and around the gender question, will be broad statements and so on and so forth. What we need on the cost of living, for example, is to get clear parameters defined. Uh, if we could do that, uh, say linking inflation uh, to prices, price changes, and saying if they exceeded this, then the vulnerable perhaps would be supported. Not mm. everybody. I mean, we all consume, yes, and pay higher prices, but the billionaires can still survive uh, without help. That those that need help would be assisted. And people have, been, have gone through very difficult times. So it's, not, it's generalized like it's everybody, but those who need help are few. Let us hope that... Uh, it will lead to an identification of boundaries beyond which we must step in to help the, the very vulnerable and the children and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I, I don't believe, for example, that the gender rule will pass. You don't uh, believe it will pass? We don't have a solution mm -hmm. on the gender rule within the confines of the current constitutional provision. Uh, and even in mathematics, there are problems that do not have solutions. That's why there are uh, offers around uh, mathematical thinking, think tanks around the world are uh, seeking people who can participate to help get solutions to particular problems. This one, within, within the boundary set, is not going to work. You can go the Rwanda, Rwanda way, in which, in which case we have to redefine the, how the structure of our politics looks at, at representation. Uh, they have a lot of appointative mm. positions. And they have also got a situation in which uh, the party wins and the, then it, it nominates candidates uh, from its ranks in the numbers that are related to whatever that win is. And there you can calculate what you need to get a two-thirds gender rule. Mm -hmm. But I also think that uh, given today's Kenya's problems, that, it, it, that I don't think it's one of the you know, sort of uh, frontline challenges we have got already, uh, as I have seen it, the the girl child has done very well. The trajectory is upward. The boy child is not doing well. Uh, I think it's just unfortunate. We have to begin to think about the gender question from a slightly different perspective. Uh, gender is not women and gender mm. is not men.
gender is generic. Uh, but yes, it's generic. But we went into this with gender being women. And that's not necessarily there for the right thing to pitch for. Mm -hmm. The, the, well, <laughs> the, the cost of living and the gender question do in fact have uh, solutions that uh, part of which are of a constitutional nature. Let me start with the cost of living. Um, a key driver of inflation and the cost of living is behavior of government. Which behavior? Government expenditure and how government finances that expenditure. So for instance, when you look at where we are now, uh, the reason the circumstance of debt distress is in, in the specter of, of perhaps default continues to grow is because uh, whereas central bank is using high interest rates to try and uh, contract the economy or to try and uh, bring down money supply and control inflation, government on the other side is increasing its expenditure which means it has to tax people more and it has to borrow more. Mm. And that's exactly the kind of circumstance that led Ghana into default. Mm. The question is, how could you constrain future executives, uh, future administrations from taking certain economic choices mm. uh, depending on the circumstance of the day? And one can contemplate, for example, the same way we have presidential term limits or term limits for governor. You, I'm sure uh, my fellow economist Bunyas will agree we, we should be able to constrain administration so that you don't have a structural deficit. You cannot have a deficit forever. We should be able to say, maybe you can have a deficit for five years, but you cannot have a deficit for more than five continuous years, mm -hmm. so that uh, administrations uh, make the right economic choices or the right choices of economic policies. And I think that, uh, uh, so therefore, cost of living is very much. Now, if you go to Article 43, um, and, and in many ways, people argued this uh, back in 2010. Who enforces the economic and social rights? We've put there in the Katiba that, you know, all of us as Kenyans uh, have a right to certain economic outcomes. Now, how do you enforce? Who do you sue when the cost of living is high? Okay. Now, of course, you can argue democratically, you sue the administration of the day by voting them out in the next cycle. But what else can you do? And I think that those are the issues that ought to be debated. On this question of, of gender, and I agree with Bunyasi, gender is not women, and gender is not men. Gender is uh, the gender. totality. <laughs> the gender is gender. But gender is many, women, countries, gender is many countries, for example, South Africa, have chosen proportional representation as the way in which they arrive at elected representatives. And in many ways, it is seen as a superior. Remember, right now, one of the big issues is boundary limitation. Why? Because some constituencies have three, four, five uh, times more people than their neighboring constituencies. If you have proportional representation, you don't have that problem. And proportional representation then allows you uh, to actually m uh, make uh, the choices if you have fewer men, then you nominate more men. If you have fewer women, then you nominate more women. Yeah. So the solutions are there. Um, in my view, the reason I am calling the private sector to step up is that we have 60 days to think really deeply and technically about the solutions and to see how those solutions could be implemented in the Kenyan context. Uh, we need all hands on deck, in my view, particularly technically and professionally, in order to do the correct thing. Finally, on, uh, on, on uh, uh, Mr. Obat's uh, um, uh, point about the risk of the process. Now, in reality, the outcomes of these talks can only go in three ways. Mm -hmm. There could be changes that do not require a change in law, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I guess those can be implemented fairly or easier. I, I'm not, even, you know, uh, <laughs> because it's like, like now police reform. Yeah. I'm not sure whether it is easier or not, but it may not require a new a law new in order to effect police reform. But there are issues that will require some kind of law. 
And there are definitely issues that will require a change in the constitution. A number of those issues, if there is a change in the constitution, it will imply a referendum. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these really are the, the pathways mm -hmm. to entrenching whatever the outcomes. Uh, but I agree with you that is there risk as the matter is handled, uh, particularly by a closed session of, of political uh, leaders, can things change? Uh, so there is a little bit of risk there, but vigilance is the answer is the to answer. it. Vigilance is the answer to it. All I right, uh, aside with that, unless you want to uh, chime in uh, on it, but I wanted just to hark back. No, I just wanted to chime in that, that okay? for me, the constitution, the processes we have are, when you look at them on the outside and without, without any emotion, are excellent. We have the checks and balances within the constitution. We have all those things. It is the people who are supposed to implement them that is the problem. When we have an unbalanced budget, it's people sitting around the table that are doing things. Mm -hmm. The expectation from the constitution is that they'll do it right. Mm -hmm. Right? But if they don't and they choose to do it in a different way, that is a betrayal of the trust that the constitution places upon those people to lead the country in a way that befits mm -hmm. the citizen of this country. So we can have a lot of discussions, but the key thing at the end of the day, like in any corporation, in any organization, any company, it is only as good as the leadership that runs that organization. Mm -hmm. Running a business has got its rules, you've got all your accounting principles, everything else, right? But you make a decision as an individual mm -hmm. with the facts that you have, and you can make a wrong decision. You can choose to make a wrong decision as well. Yeah, based on what you want. So, my, you know, I think my, my key thing here is that we have systems and it's only as good as the people who are running those systems. All right, system as, is as only as good as the people who are running the systems. And uh, we just wanted to see how uh, the action stations were on over the weekend regarding also the blackouts. And uh, the news <laughs> is so far also a couple lost, you know, a child because of the blackouts as well. And... Uh, if it was, it was all systems go, we saw heads uh, rolling and up to now we have not been given. But there is a report that has come out and we had the CS Church saying we should stop the blame game. And it was a faulty system that now everyone is raising accusatory fingers. You know, sometimes even when you cannot deliver you, I'll always say the system had a problem and you can where will you take me <laughs> well, because look, when you talk about look, the system there is a faulty system it's there, a, there is so much ambiguity in this <laughs> faulty system. The, the standard yeah. to which what, what you say there is a technical challenge the, the standard to which we hold ourselves yeah. in some countries mm -hmm. i mean if you go back years ago even 15 maybe mm -hmm. 20 years ago you saw uh, a minister for transport in india mm -hmm. resigning because there was a there was a, a, train, a train crash. Train crash yes. yes. Not because he was the MD of the Railways Corporation, yeah. not because he was the signals guy who failed, but a disaster has occurred. So if we truly were, were living up to superior uh, standards in the, in, the, in the public space, Chil Chil should be resigning. Mm -hmm. It should not be. Mm -hmm. should not be telling us. It should be saying, "Oh, yeah. sorry, stop blaming." Who should we not? Why should we mm -hmm. not? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. system is supposed to work. It has not worked. And it has failed under your watch. watch. And if you remember in 2008, 2009, 2010, that culture had begun to emerge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we called it political responsibility. Mm -hmm. When something goes wrong in your docket as a minister, we expect you to step aside mm -hmm. because it is the failure of your leadership or should be seen as the failure of your leadership that things have gone wrong mm -hmm. under your watch. So we, it should not to, be let to fly. To take, to take the point that uh, the need is saying, um, and I'll go back to systems mm -hmm. very clearly. If you look at the failures that have happened, look at the hospital where the child died, mm -hmm. look at the airport which went blank, mm -hmm. blackout, yeah? mm -hmm. look at the country which went, mm -hmm. had a blackout as well. All of them are because something that should have worked in a particular way did not work. Yeah. The hospital had a backup power, five generators, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? And yet, the oxygen system did supplying that chair did not work because of the blackout. Because of the blackout. Right? But the blackout, when, you, when, the, when the general sit, uh, kicks in, the first place that should get power mm -hmm. is the ICU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, it, and then the power then goes, goes down to all the other services, street lighting is last, yeah? Within, within, within that, that, that facility. Mm -hmm. 
the airport is the same thing right when something happens the first place that should have power is the runway which is a safety critical place right and the control tower mm. then after that you move to the next and the next and the next and the next now that sequence is where anybody who is in charge of an organization should be looking at the risk of that system not working mm -hmm. and that is how all these emergency systems are normally tested on a regular basis to make sure that when they're required they will perform the way they're supposed to perform that is your leadership mm -hmm. that makes sure that you do those kind of things at the national level exactly the same thing what are the risks within our energy system and these whatever happened is exactly the typical kind of risk if you if we've had over the last three or four years mm -hmm. several national blackouts yeah and all of them they say system failure mm -hmm. right there was an issue at, 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 I think at the, at, the, at the national control center yeah. last year right which caused a national blackout there are others when birds went and sort of you know and, and a monkey mm -hmm. went into a control center and, and did certain things and a certain portion of the country had a blackout mm -hmm. and so forth so even this recent blackout the wind power system is more sensitive to disturbances in the national grid than say a geothermal you know or a diesel system mm. or, or whatever hydro. yeah <laughs> and even the, the you know the solar ones as well at that because they are converting what is called direct current into alternative alternative current and all that control systems are sensitive and if something hits them their first thing is to shut down to save the technology that is here mm. and then once things are control are, are correct the other side then they will begin to feed back in slowly it isn't as though you're off when it's corrected it automatically goes back on it doesn't happen that way so i think the we need to understand that the sensitivities of those systems mm -hmm. is such that the leadership that is in charge of those systems has to sit and understand the risks the, the that, that are there the challenges that could be there and mitigate them or ensure that they will work when they're required so and i think in this particular case whether it is the airport whether it is the hospital whether it is the national blackout and you could you must be have a few others around the country in each of those places the leadership is culpable so how then do we uh, in terms of uh, okay let me hear from uh, bunyasi sako before the yeah next i just want to say um I, I hear what my colleagues have said and i think they're right they're right spot on my naive interpretation of this is that the areas in which explanation is are easiest to pin down is, is engineering in, isn't it yeah. but it's a system that works with set rules uh and you you know what will happen if you did if you put a and c together rather than a and b and d uh, this will happen and that, they know all of that they can reverse it back but you see we got we get these broad statements to fool one mm -hmm. uh you say like they said oh the the uh, the, 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 the wind power in the um, angalani and you know this is not part of uh, they say it's not i don't know kpl so it's not uh gdc this is another lot it's even get that you know they're just trying to fool around with words and so on uh, i think that the secretary responsible ought to have come out early and clearly and take a responsibility uh clearly just tell the, the people what exactly happened mm -hmm. i don't have confidence that uh, the same cannot be repeated tomorrow that's my my worry mm -hmm. and then lastly i think there must be mitigating measures at the at, it, at the various facilities as the uh, mr bath has just explained uh, hospitals and others that have stand by generators uh and know the hierarchy of of uh, of things when there is an emergency it can't be that there is a power blackout and therefore you know, everybody was helpless uh when in fact as you say they may have generators and that other, other kinds of things they are still liable i think for negligence uh like in the cases not just the one case where mm -hmm. uh, a couple lost a child which is very heavy but just for that kind of thing you know there's still negligence if they have generators and Indeed. they don't know and they, 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 they don't kick in or they don't have fuel at that time you know, that kind of nonsense because we expect every day uh, there has to be checking uh, the auditing of the yes, system yes and yes. it's supposed to be fail safe yes. so when you talk about uh, the total negligence as it is right now mm -hmm. can we talk about the compensation we've had someone who now has lost a baby 
many businesses were affected and people wondering how can even Makinyozi be working with uh, uh, you know a small generator and a whole JKA cannot be fully functional because of the failure of a generator at the end of the day. I think so, so guys, we have to see the business community is calling for compensation. On it. Where does it really come? And uh, we can pick that with the issue that uh, they have oh, so, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, 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 the thing is this. Um, I think the business community uh, and anybody calling for compensation is correct. You see, there's, uh, there's something we say like a uh, legitimate expectation of how things are supposed to work. Otherwise, the whole economy would, would come to a standstill. So there is a legitimate expectation that the power system has a certain level of reliability mm -hmm. and that where you have backup systems, they themselves have a certain level of reliability and, and all the way to the what uh, Obath and, and Bunyasi are explaining. So that for ICU, ICU must always have power. Okay? And, and even the switch over... If this power system fails, say, to, to, <laughs> to the backup system, and if that fails to the backup system, uh, must be f as near instantaneous as is practical mm -hmm. because then somebody's going to die. Uh, so I think uh, calling for it is, is, is correct. But the reason I felt I I compensation is, in a sense, also related to bailout, it comes down to whose money. Mm -hmm. And that's why the point of responsibility. Now... Uh, if in like the bailout circumstance uh, and, and frankly don't like the way the president is saying that he's being asked it's not his money I mean there's a way in which public officers we, we talk as though tax money is simply because I'm the governor of like Ipiawa, the president of Kenya as though tax money is my own personal checkbook that I'm writing and, and that kind of thinking honestly leads to very poor decision making now who, if we are doing bailout, whose money is it? It is actually your taxes and my taxes and all the other Kenyans that will be used to pay for management mistakes of some people. And is that correct? Mm -hmm. And now it is the same in this, in this circumstance. That if you say KPLC compensate for this loss, okay? remember uh, that the uh, uh, KPLC is largely yeah, owned uh, by by by, uh, government. Uh, by government, which ultimately means it is your taxes that will go to pay for that compensation. Which means, even if you agree we compensate, they are, we must be holding people to account for management failure. Now, the way responsibility works, certainly from a citizen's point of view, um, we should start the the minister concerned. Yeah ought to be the first one yeah? and he or she ought to be holding a board of KPLC and that board is holding the management of KPLC to account. That is the way it should work. Mm -hmm. All right, that is the way it should work and uh, somebody needs to of course pay up and compensate for the losses as well uh, even for the grieving family that uh, lost a baby because of the power blackout. Well, uh, the tail end of the program right now, I just wanted to focus on what is happening also with Kenya Airways right now because they have reported uh, it's uh, their pre-tax loss which widened in the first half of 2023 as uh, a weaker shilling or a weaker Kenyan shilling eclipsed improved revenues as we know. The airline, one of Africa's three biggest, has been insolvent since 2018 after an expansion drive left it with hundreds of millions of dollars of debt it could not service its pre-tax loss rose to 21.7 billion shillings that is 149.45 million dollars in the first half from 99 billion shillings a year earlier ellen moriri the airline's chief financial officer told an investor briefing that the foreign exchange losses jumped 15.5 15.3 billion shillings from 398 million shillings in the same period in 2022 as well. So let's just uh, try and decipher this uh, briefly. Uh, KQ on, uh, on, a, on a Mayday call. It continues. Patrick Obath. <laughs> the chief economist that I can talk. <laughs> I, 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 I think what you're seeing here is purely the continuation of the mistakes of the past, right? And they're being, um, they, they, it's being aggravated by the reality of the rest of the world. 
we had COVID that hit, hit, hit the airline, right? As they're trying to recover, that brings you down. Um, the whole essence of the interconnectivity of, 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 of you know, of, of opportunities in the world, mm -hmm. people will, you know, once they're in trouble, people take their, their cargo somewhere else and the passengers move somewhere else, that then hits you again. Now you have the, you know, our self-inflicted, uh, not self-inflicted, but nearly self-inflicted issue with, the, with currency, right? That hits, right? And when that happens, it hits your service and it hits your revenue. So this, I mean, Kenya Airways is in a situation that that no manager in this world would like to be in. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, is, it is just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, the, 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 the green shoots were that it actually had an operating profit. Mm -hmm. Means that for the year, it is actually making more money than it is spending. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And that is good because it means that the underlying issues that were stopping the airline from sort of trying to recover mm -hmm. are on the right path. Mm -hmm. And once, if they can sustain good operating profitability, mm -hmm. then the rest can be sorted out with, in, with people who are trying to sort it out, knowing that at the end of the day, the money will come back. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But if the operating profitability is not there, mm -hmm. then who is going to put money into a place that you know that you're just sinking it and it's going to be consumed without making any money? And, so, and, <laughs> and you know, this is, this is partly why like, the privatization programs... Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing has to make sense. Yeah. There's a way in which the political class talks about privatization yeah. without solving that particular, solving that particular issue. Yeah. Which, which is this investor who will come with good money into an open-ended pit that, uh, that there's no chance of There's recovery. no chance of it recovery. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that is when you talk, you know, the, all these things that are, are requiring money from the government, mm. that is the bottom line. They need to have an operating profit. And once they have that, then somebody knows that their fundamentals are right in that place. Thank you. Let's just, let's just uh, wind up on that uh, particular note with you as well. What, uh, what do you think about KQ? Do you fly KQ? I, I, I do fly KQ uh, from time to time. I'm quite liberal in the domestic market. Uh, I go for convenience and so on. So I don't always take uh, KQ, but... Um, uh, you mentioned, uh, Patrick has mentioned uh, one aspect I'm not focused on, that they have achieved an operating profit, which means they're doing something that probably is right. Uh, but excuses are out, Forex and so on, I think. I see that the fares are adjusted based on, uh, well, what's the unit of account of aviation? <coughs> it's not the dollar, it's, uh, uh, I forget what that unit of account is, from which it then is translated into whatever the currency is. Mm -hmm. They keep up with the exchange rate variation there. So uh, passengers have been paying what they should pay. Uh, there may be other areas where they have some problem. Uh, but it must not be a bottomless pit. Indeed. Now. But it must not be a bottomless pit. I think that's a good a place to wind up. Uh, let's get your uh, closing remarks. Um, ready, 30 seconds. National dialogue. We need all hands on deck. All hands on deck. Bring your input. Bring your input. Patrick about your parting shots. Uh, the opportunity that this national dialogue brings is great. Let us dump things in there. Let it be sorted out, mixed, and we should have, hopefully, a nice um, presentation on the table Fantastic. for us to enjoy. Right. Just Let support. us keep corruption on the headlines and deal with it decisively deal with it decisively. And of course, also as a winding up, still we bring this back, uh, Dito Katun, which is, uh, of course, our, our national concern with the police uniforms that they are seeking <laughs> also your input. <laughs> we have Bile who's saying uh, that, uh, yes, uh, police uniforms should not have pockets, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> also, the pockets are actually being uh, uh, ripped off there by the scissors. Uh, they should not have pockets. Uh, of course, when you're talking about corruption as well, that has been a big issue. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much, Patrick Bath who is the chair of Kepsa Foundation, Dinitum Radin, immediate former governor of uh, like Kipi, and also an economist, and also the chair of Kenya Development Corporation, Bunyasi Sakwa. Bill Okero was feeling rough this morning, just sent a text that he's all feeling well. We wish him, uh, of course, uh, good health ahead today, and he should recuperate at home uh, smoothly. Thank you very much for your valid company. Don't go away. We continue with the conversation here on Morning Prime. Coming up next, we have uh, Climate Action. It's all about climate financing and Action Aid. Action Aid is steamrolling a campaign 
on climate justice and also financing as well. What really happens, especially with the devastation of climate uh, affecting so many people, do they really get compensated and how that compensation should actually be handled as well? The issue of climate swapping with other countries when we have a sovereign date, uh, we shall also be discussing those and a raft of other issues here on Morning Prime. Don't go away.